In this presentation, we are going to look at the basic ways in which our body obtains energy. We have two primary methods for getting energy. One is from food, and the other is from our body stores. We obtain energy from food when we've recently eaten. However, if we haven't recently eaten, our body can tap into different storage forms of energy in order to provide us the energy that we need. When we talk about energy, we are really talking about our body's ability to do work. And by work, I mean any sort of movement or breathing or any of the things that need to happen for our bodies to function. We measure energy in calories. Technically, calories is a measure of heat, but we use it to measure how much energy or work capacity a nutrient can provide us. When we look at the energy yielding nutrients, there are basically four compounds that can provide our body with calories or energy. Carbohydrates, fat, primarily in the form of triglycerides, protein, and alcohol. Of these, alcohol does provide us calories, however, it's not considered a nutrient since it isn't essential for health, so we won't be looking at a lot of details of alcohol at this point. Carbohydrates are broken down primarily into the form of glucose, which then can be used for energy. Triglycerides are broken down into glycerol and fatty acids, and protein is broken down into a variety of amino acids. Any of these end products on the right can be further converted into energy. If our body needs more energy than can be provided from the food that we've recently eaten, it will tap into our body's storage forms of energy. There are a variety of ways that our body stores energy. Three main ways are in the form of glycogen, triglycerides, and in our muscles or tissue. Glycogen is the storage form of carbohydrate, so when our bodies tap into glycogen stores, that's converted to glucose. Triglycerides are the storage form of fats, which are stored primarily in our adipose tissue and to some extent in our muscles. When our body taps into these triglycerides, they are broken down into glycerol and fatty acids. Our muscles and our tissue are technically a storage form of protein or amino acids. However, ideally we won't be tapping into these because we don't really want to break down those tissues. But if our body does need amino acids for a variety of reasons, it can break down muscles or tissue to yield those amino acids. When we look at energy sources from food compared to energy sources from our body stores, you will notice that both of them lead to the same end products, glucose, glycerol, fatty acids, and amino acids. So regardless of whether our body pulled the energy from the food we've just recently eaten or tapped into our body stores to obtain that energy, once it goes through certain metabolic processes, we'll end up with essentially the same end products. Those energy nutrients or end products are then converted into a compound called adenosine triphosphate or ATP. We'll look now at exactly what ATP is and why our body converts those energy nutrients into ATP. ATP is often considered our body's energy currency. The reason it's called this is because the ATP molecule is actually what's broken apart to release the energy to do the work our body needs to do. The ATP is stored primarily in the muscle tissue, so when your muscles get a message that they need to do something, to move or to do whatever they need to do, this ATP molecule is what is actually broken down to release the energy to do work. This sort of cartoon depiction of ATP is showing the A is adenosine and each of the P's as a phosphate group. Between the phosphate group, the squiggly red lines are high energy phosphate bonds. So this is where the actual energy is stored and when we need to do that work and release those, that energy, those bonds are broken. 
Just a moment ago, I talked about the fact that our body can tap into storage forms of energy when we need it, when we haven't just recently eaten and we need that energy. I talked about muscles or tissue, glycogen, and triglycerides. Now I want to add a few other things to that list by looking a little bit more closely at our body's stores, or in some cases I would like to think of these more as pools of energy. The reason I think of some of these as pools rather than stores is they're very small amounts and our body doesn't really leave it there for very long. So it puts it there for a short amount of time so it can pull it out easily, but then it quickly has to be replenished into that pool. So the top three items that I have on this list or compounds are really things that are found in very small amounts in the body and can't be used for a long period of time. So we'll start out at the top of the list with ATP and phosphocreatine. We just looked at ATP and talked about the fact that that is the energy currency. That is the ultimate product that our body needs to be able to release the work. The ATP that is found in our body will only give us seconds worth of energy. So our body has to constantly be replenishing that ATP. Phosphocreatine, or PCR, is another way that we can quickly replenish that ATP. However, our body stores of phosphocreatine are also very small. So ATP and phosphocreatine can be used for very short bursts of activity, but then must quickly be replenished. When we look down to the next item of blood glucose, we do have some glucose in our blood, but our body has to maintain that in a very narrow range. So our body will use some of that blood glucose for energy, but then it must quickly replenish that by either eating or tapping into glycogen stores if necessary. So blood glucose is another source of energy that is really a pretty minimal source and can't be used for a long period of time. The third item in this list is free fatty acids or serum triglycerides. Those are the fats essentially that are readily available to use in our body, but again this is a pretty small amount and if we have more of a need for fat we're going to tap into our fat stores. The next item on the list is muscles or tissue. There's actually quite a lot of storage capacity in our muscles, meaning if we broke down a lot of our muscles or tissues, we could obtain a lot of calories or a lot of energy from that. But I think we would all agree this isn't the ideal way to obtain calories. So although muscles and tissue could provide a significant amount of calories, for example, if someone was in a starvation state, it's not the ideal source of calories and energy for the body. The final two components are those that are, mo are our most significant and usable forms, storage forms of energy in our body. As I mentioned, glycogen is the storage form of carbohydrates in our body. It's stored in the liver and muscle. Glycogen storage is fairly limited and varies from person to person, but generally we can store somewhere in the range of 1,500 to 2,000 calories in glycogen. So it's actually a fairly limited amount of storage capacity of carbohydrates, which is why we need to be frequently eating carbohydrates and replenishing those storage, that storage of glycogen within our body. Our body can, however, break that glycogen down into glucose so it can use that for energy. Triglycerides are the last item on the list. These are primarily stored in adipose tissue and a little bit in the muscles. Our triglyceride storage capacity is virtually unlimited. Um, it depends on a person's size and how much fat storage they have, but we have a lot of capacity to store energy as fat, and that's really where our body stores the most energy for the longest amount of time. So if we need to go a longer period of time without adequate food, that's where our body is going to pull from. So when we look at these different potential energy sources or body stores or pools, keep in mind that some of these are used only for real short bursts of energy and have a very small pool to be able to draw from in the body, and others have a larger pool and can be used for longer duration activity. 
So in summary, a few key points to keep in mind. One is calorie is the unit of measure that we use to describe energy. Energy can come from food or from body stores. The food sources of energy or calories are carbohydrate, fat, and protein, in addition to alcohol, which we didn't look at in a lot of detail. Each of the carbohydrate, fat, and protein can be stored to some extent in the body and pulled out when needed. ATP, or adenosine triphosphate, is our energy currency and is the molecule that actually releases the energy at the moment we need it. And the energy source that's used really depends on the conditions at that time. One condition might be whether we've recently eaten or whether we haven't eaten for a while, so whether we're fed or fasting. Another condition may be whether we're doing a short burst of energy or a long duration activity.